uh, he, in, uh, in Lviv. And, and I just want to say this here without uh, taking away attention from our uh, distinguished guest, Volodymyr Rafayenko, um, that uh, the life of Colonel Petra, who passed away in 2000, really reflected the whole complexity of what Ukraine had to go through. And uh, whenever we had a chance, we invited him here for a variety of social and intellectual events. And the interesting part was, although he was uh, in a German camp, he was in a Soviet camp, he had really undergone all the um, uh, traumatic events that, that uh, millions of Ukrainians had actually gone through, there was no bitterness. In him. He was a man who loved life and who actually gave his optimism to us, and he asked us to actually use our money to promote Ukrainian studies, which we faithfully did after Colonel Petra um, passed away. Uh, some 20 years ago, we kept his memory alive. So I want to mention this uh, because he really did a lot for Ukrainian studies, apart from that, uh, which other uh, donors, generous donors did, among others also our former vice president for research, Liu Shalupa, who really was a great support for our institute. Uh, and I had the honor of cooperating with him uh, as former director of the Institute. Uh, and so did Professor Hale, uh, who also the former director of the Institute. So Ukrainian studies really got a lot of support, both institutional, financial, and keeps getting the support. We even got it at a time when Ukraine was not so much in the headlines. That is in the early 2000s, when there were no many sensations to report, but it was still something that we faithfully and, and loyally did. Uh, I want to say a few words about our guest today because his biography is quite extraordinary. For the first 45 years of his life, he actually wrote in Russian. He was considered a Russophone, a, um, a Russian language writer living in Donetsk in Ukraine where he was born in 1969 where he studied. He studied actually Slavic languages and literatures, later what uh, is called culturology, which basically is cultural studies also there, and uh, who made the uh, really, I would say, um, earth-shaking decision um, in the uh, 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 2000 teens, uh, 2014 or so, to actually abandon Russian as his language, not just as his native language, but also as his creative tool, which for a writer, of course, is a huge decision. And I tried, when, when I prepared for this event, I tried to remember comparable uh, uh, events. For example, many German Jewish writers uh, who had to leave Germany in 1933 gave up German, learned other languages, for example, English, and became writers in English. But even Nabokov, uh, the Russian writer, when he um, uh, left uh, Russia after the revolution, at some point decided to no longer write in Russian, but switched to English and became one of the greatest stylists of, um, of the English language with his uh, novels that, uh, that we all know and heard about. So it is not unheard of to do that. But of course, the interesting part here, the fascinating part is what kind of political circumstances caused this switch from Russian to Ukrainian for a man who lived in Ukraine and still spoke and wrote um, Russian. If you read the novel Monday Green, um, then there is a lot of there are a lot of musings, a lot of uh, uh, thoughts, a lot of con contemplation about uh, this question, and also about the status of the Russian language, the status of the Ukrainian language um, in Ukraine, and that's also something I would like to ask Mr. Rafienko about. And of course, we will open the floor at some point and, and welcome um, all of you to ask your questions, whether they are literary or political or cultural in general, and so on. So, on. so I want to say um, this is uh, a unique case among the contemporary uh, Ukrainian writers. Several of them have been translated. Uh, and have been published in English, so they are available in English. And thanks to Amazon, if you um, put in uh, Mr. Rafayenka's name, then you will also find other Ukrainian writers. Um, uh, for example, Yuri Andropovich, who uh, has been translated with several of his books. Um, th there's a whole range of writers, some of whom I know, for example, Sergei Radan, uh, who wrote some uh, quite fascinating, uh, very modern, funny, witty uh, uh, novels. But there is a lot to explore, and so uh, I want to encourage you all to try this. Um, I think uh, Ukrainian writers have a good sense of humor, uh, sometimes dark humor, uh, but that, of course, is something we can connect to, we can relate to, and we can 
um, um, easily make sense of. Not everything there is, is as easy. Mr. Achienka in particular uh, is considered a postmodern writer um, in that uh, he does actually take stylistic impulses from various epochs and is uh, inspired by them. And so we have a, a, a wide range of cultural influences and, and impulses in his works. Uh, and so in, in, um, in one of his um, works, uh, let me see, I, I, I need to make, make sure that I don't get my, yeah. So for example, in uh, The Length of Days uh, in Russian Dolgata Dnie, which has been translated from Russian into Ukrainian, by the way, and, and was nominated for a prize for Ukrainian literature. Um, in one paragraph, you can find the French poet Béranger, you can find the Italian pop singer Salvador Adamo, you can find Clint Eastwood, you can find the mentioning of the fall of the House of Usher. I would say um, Volodymyr uh, Rafienko's literature, his, his prose is saturated with cultural references, both ironic and serious, and that makes it provocative, thought-provoking, um, and really, uh, it, it's, a, it's a very rich kind of um, prose. It can sometimes be highly sophisticated, super intellectual, and it can sometimes be brutal and vulgar. And all of that is a uh, fantastic mix that is uh, you know, stylistically very Polish and, and, and really fascinating. Mr. Rafienka wrote seven novels and three volumes of poetry in Russian. A lot of it is actually available online if you're interested. Um, it is very good. It's, it's, it is a high quality uh, prose. Uh, what I could find, but maybe he can correct me if, if this is not correct, um, that he was influenced, among others, by Faulkner, by Bunin, by Gabriel García Márquez, and others. So we, what we see is he's a Ukrainian writer who actually has been influenced and shaped by impulses from many uh, national literatures and many national um, uh, cultures. His Russian novels have won prizes. Um, uh, so one, uh, Moscow, the artist Mento, uh, won a uh, rather prestigious prize. Uh, another one, a diligy that he wrote, uh, one volume of it is The Demon of Descartes, again, a foreign allusion right in the title here, also won a prize. Um, and um, uh, his new novel, the one that he wrote in Ukrainian that has been translated into English by Mark Andrychik, our colleague from Colombia, who has done an enormous amount of things for uh, spreading the word about Ukrainian culture, Ukrainian literature. He has translated this into a very readable English. So any of you that have not had the chance, you can read it on Kindle, um, uh, uh, you know, rather inexpensively online or on, uh, in paperback and so on. So on. Um, he writes about learning to speak and to write in Ukrainian. And he is very honest and very sincere about this process, which he describes as a hard process. In an interview from 2017 that I read, um, that was published in Ukraine, he's saying how hard it was to actually switch to Ukrainian and to learn it well. And the, uh, the journalist uh, ironically said that one can tell he has uh, a slight, um, not an accent I would say, but the chip sounded very hard and there was a Galician sound to, to his Ukrainian. Uh, so, so, you know, you can, this, I, I read this, I can't judge it, I don't speak Ukrainian myself, so uh, I only read it, so I, I can't, I can't uh, judge it, but that was, um, that was said there. Um, Mr. Rafienka is very well versed in world literature, uh, as I mentioned before, for example, he taught drama, uh, among other things, and so for this course on drama that he taught uh, in Kiev, he uh, included Sophocles, Shakespeare, Brecht, Chekhov, and so on. So he's um, uh, uh, a very uh, well-versed specialist on international literature. And so his, his again, his, his own writing is, that is culturally um, uh, uh, saturated with allusions to different epochs and so on. It's not always easy to figure out the exact point of view. And this is also one of my questions um, for him. There's a lot of irony. There are a lot of you know, different levels of meaning here, but I can only encourage you to not um, give up on that um, uh, because the, uh, uh, the, the, the reward for the, distinct, uh, the distinguishing reader is actually, um, you know, a very rich view of what Ukraine is up to today and what many, many complexities there are in the processes that are um, unfolding. Um, I want to ask, Mr. Rafienka first, um, when he was writing in Russian, 
did he have an exact idea who his readership was, what kind of readers he had, and did he feel that when he left behind Russia, that he also left behind that readership and moved to a new type of implied reader, to a new imagined reader that we think of every writer has? яка ваша спеціальна аудиторія і коли ви перейшли на українську мову, чи ви усвідомлювали, чи усвідомили, думали про те, що ви покинули свого російського читача і пішли в пошуку іншого читача? Чи може ваші російські читачі пішли за вами? <кій> Справа в тому, що на конкретного читача працює тільки жанрові. Література тому я її роблю, вона працює з уявним читачем. Um, only genre literature is focused on a particular reader. The kind of literature he creates is focused, um, is aimed at an imaginary reader, so to speak. So if any reader I can read. І мені здається взагалі перебільшення орієнтації письменництва саме на якомусь мас, на якомусь читача. So you think it's an exaggeration that uh, writers are focused on a particular writer. So he doesn't believe that there's a specific reader that he that writers are focused on, writers write. Більш продуктивною, мені здається, думка Марселя Пуста, що немає жодного Марселя Пуста до написання роману. Тобто писання – це більше відбука річ, ніж просто збування. So he, um, uh, is quoting Marcel Proust, he likes the, the, this idea of, of Marcel Proust, that there's no Marcel Proust until Marcel Proust writes something. So everything is, is a lot deeper than simply uh, an imaginary reader that a writer is focused on. So the, the writer is also, uh, in, capturing himself to some extent in the process of writing, overcoming himself, and at the same time enticing the reader, attracting the reader. So this may sound dramatic, but he thinks that, uh, he believes that until he finishes his novel and puts the last Period after the last sentence, there is no reader until he's done writing. That contradicts some literary theory, but that's okay. So that's the That's that's fine. I mean, we, we have to learn from the practitioners and not the other around. So, so then let me ask you a little more specific question, and that has to do with the sound of length. So some people really underestimate um. The differences between Ukraine and Russian. I find the differences between the two languages profound. And I'm not saying this out of any political motive or something. I really do. I really think that um, the uh, intonation, the mel melodiousness, and so on, which he praises in his novel, he says, what a magical and melodious language Ukrainian is, but it's distinct and really different from, from Russian. Він розуміє цю різницю, і, але для багатьох ця різниця може бути не такою зрозумілою, як скажімо, для нього. І він говорить про те, що українська мова була звична з української мови, ця музикальність її, він це відчуває, і що ми навіть це не покажемо в своєму мові. Ні, Гріс? Um, you know, the, the German writer Thomas Mann, he distinguished between, between two types of writers, the ear writers and the eye writers. Thomas Mann did this now with Buma Tipan Pismen, the Tisha Pesalana book, and Tisha Pesalana Oko. And I know that you play the piano. Uh, I, I read this in, in an article. Uh, and so, I, my assumption is also from reading your prose that you belong more to the type of ear writers, that, that the sound and the melody of, uh, of your language is is really more uh important than than the visual uh impressions that you get is, is that correct professor, can, can one say that professor only is nice to be right in the piano he the vast more uh um yeah 
powiązana z buką i z buką niż z oką i, 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 i kartyniją, jakie oko wygląda. Tak, tak za wsze te zwyczajne, zwyczajne teksty i ja czuwa zwyczajne, zwyczajne nikogo może nie przeczytać. Ale mi nie dużo ważliwe, żeby wyrywały z pewna rytmika, żeby słowa wkładały się w pewny malunek. He writes in a way so his words create a picture. And um, it, it ends up being visual because someone has to read it. They read the um, they read the text itself, but for him the sound of the words is time is paramount. How has switching from Russian to Ukrainian changed your perception of, of the sound of your own prose? Jak perechid z rosyjskiej na ukraińską zmieniło wasze stawienia do zwyczajnie waszych wyborów? No, nie wiem. Oskielki ukraińska mowa jest coraz druga. Ona zmieniła wsze stawienia do zwyczajnie. Sprawa w tym, że ukraińską mówię i ja nie mogę wasz tym wyrunęć. Ona... Rosyjską mówię? Tak. Ona może. So, he, he, basically, he says that he can't bullshit in Ukrainian, but he can't do it in Russian. <laughs> What does it mean, he can't be it? Ja думаю, że on musi się pogodzić, nablizyć się do pewna Правила гармонійна мовою рівно ще років 10-15. Так, і і feels that he to really comprehend Ukrainian fully, he needs another 10-15 years to immerse himself in it. Тому я дуже прискіпливо відношусь до кожного слова, так як я не відношусь, коли користуюсь і користувався російською мовою. And that's why he pays you know, really uh, close attention to everyone. He's very He's very finicky about every word that he chooses in a way that he never was with Russian. When he writes in Ukrainian, he's maniacally responsible. <laughs> As it's hard work. <laughs> no, no, no. Yes, because because his role changes, but he can't he can't just automatically. Ваша роль змінилася, ви не робите це автоматично, ви мусите думати над кожним словом, так? Ну, зараз вже не так, але я писав мандарин цей роман, я одночасно навчав мову. No longer, he doesn't have to worry about each word, but when he was writing on the green, he was in the middle of learning Ukrainian as well, so he was writing as he was learning. І в романі, мені здається, дуже багато чирого здивування мовою, Uh, and he think, uh, he feels that in the in the novel there is a lot of um pleasant surprise by the language that he is learning. And um by writing the book, he also learned Ukrainian to some extent. Але я почув певний момент, що не я володіваю мовою, а мова володіває мовою. He's not quite sure whether it's a, a, a factor of the Ukrainian language, uh, but as he was learning Ukrainian, he felt at some point that it was not he who was who was sort of forming the language, learning the language, but the language was controlling him. The, the language had taken hold of him. So he's not fully a subject. Ну, в цьому сенсі, звичайно, завдання письменника мені здається стати найбільш потужним і точним інструментом. And he thinks that the writer's duty is to become a very strong and powerful instrument of the language. That is a good transition to another question. What is the role of literature in Ukraine today? What has it been in the last 20-25 years? Is there even time for literature to read in fiction, to read in complicated texts and so on? And, and, or is it just the um, kind of private pleasure for um, you know, sophisticated intellectuals? 
А що є роль інтерпретів сьогодні в Україні? Чи це є е, приватне задоволення інтелектуальні? Чи яку роль тоді грає література у українському суспільстві? Чи взагалі є час на літературу? Ну, я думаю, що останні 20-30 років це час дуже дужного зростання літератури. І the last 20-30 years have been a time of great literary growth in Ukraine. And this is uh, the names that you mentioned. Uh, before the Shadan and various other words, it's a very prolific, very productive, very common. Але мені здається, що це не випадковість багатих імен, багато художників, які в поезії. Це тому, що останні десятиліття формуються в критична нація. So we don't think that it's a coincidence that we have these the powerful Ukrainian writers, because Ukraine as a political nation is being formed and they're producing literature in that regard. І в цьому сенсі процеси, що відбуваються в літературі українській, вони є з одного боку відзеркалення, а з іншого боку програмою для розвитку. So in some sense, the processes um, that are taking place in Ukraine and in Ukraine, uh, literature is a reflection of those processes, but also literature is a program for national growth. Could one say that his own path from um, Russophone uh, to Ukrainian is in a way symbolic for, for a national trend, for a national process? <laughs> Чи це є, може, таким символом національного загального такого напрямку? Ну, цілком можливо, так. Попри, попри конкретні обставини, навіть з заходом Рігії Російської, чи 11 році, Русь колесно одною з головних моментів цього перетворення було прокидання пам'яті, раптом мені стало Актуально важливо, що для моїх батьків рідна мова була російська, а для моїх партій, що мама не шукати в її бібліотеку. So he, he has had a, a, a kind of a renaissance and an awakening when uh, Russia first invaded in 2014 and um, annexed, um, occupied the next. Um, he realized that his parents spoke Russian, he spoke Russian, but his grandmother spoke Ukrainian. So his Ukrainian language started waking up with him. Right. I mean, that's also what you write about in your novel, that, that you, you rediscover the language of your childhood, right? the fairy tales. And so the, 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 right. The other, the other process that you write about, whether here or another, I may have gotten this mixed up now, is that uh, until you were in your 40s, you didn't really know much about the rest of Ukraine, like other places, other territories. And it's now that you discovered Kiev in your novel, it's about Kiev, uh, you know, this, what, what do you call it, this, this crazy city and um, everything that's going on there. But then also the rest of Ukraine, you have to, so, so, so your novel, in, in my view, is a novel of discovery, self-discovery, discovery of your past, but also discovery of Ukraine as a as a as a as a place as a look. Ви не спитали, що до 40 років є не дуже добре знало. І і цей роман, це є роман відкриття, де ви для себе відкриваєте це місто Київ і якоїсь міри і Україна теж. Не так, дійсно, я та тип характера інтроверт. Загалом не люблю He's an introvert, he doesn't like traveling. <laughs> <laughs> but the Russians, the, the Russians have helped him to travel. They <laughs> see new places. Oh, now he's only partially in the story. Yeah, when it comes to Russians, he's become an extra. Thank you for overcoming your disposition coming here. I mean, this has been a long, long, long um, journey. The last question that I have, just from a literature point of view, um, what is the authority of writers in Ukraine? Will writers be invited by television? Can a writer make a statement and the president will listen? Or are they just, uh, um, you know, the same status as opera singers or, or 
Який статус письменників сьогодні в Україні? Чи до них прислуховується політична еліта? Чи письменник в Україні має такий сам статус, як, скажімо, співачка опінута? And do people look for orientation to writers? Чи люди дивляться до письменників? Чи не очікують якісь дорогокарські письменники? Ну, мені складно сказати, я спеціальні посвідчення не проводив, але як ті бульбашці, принаймні, спілкувані і фізбучні, я бачу, що до письменника дуже-дуже поскільки ставлення, як до головного морального. Um, he hasn't held, he hasn't done any research to that, um, uh, towards that question, but in social media, writers are held in very high regard as, um, as moral authorities. So he thinks that he should have is a prime example of a, a heroic writer. He's a, he's a very talented and uh, accomplished writer, but he's also, he has a social conscience. He's always helping the Ukrainian armed forces and uh, does a lot of humanitarian work. Many writers are um, younger than uh, Volodymyr are fighting in the war. They've joined um, the Ukrainian army. And they write a while uh, at the front, uh, essays, uh, stories, social media posts. The voice of the country is the writer in Ukraine. Do you know each other? Is there some sort of organization when Ukrainian writers meet with each other, or rather, is it kind of a quiet competition each uh, on his own? Do you follow the works of your colleagues? Do you follow Andrei Kurkov, for example? Я спілкую за розум при тих, коли поки мені дивиться все цікаве. І якщо мати на увазі українську позу, то мене, ну, окрім тих, що я вже сказав, письменники, дуже-дуже важлива ще молода, молода дуже жінка, молоді письменник Софія Догович. So he likes, um, he follows the career and the writings of writers that he likes. Um, and, uh, some of those names were already uh, spoken here, but he is also very uh, interested in the following the career of a young well, female writer, Sukhmian Dukovic, yeah. the daughter. She's of, a daughter of yeah. Yeah. He, he finds her to be the strongest uh, writer in the future. I think she's available in English, as far as, as, far as I know. At least one, one book in Chinese. I believe yeah. Felix. Mm -hmm. Felix, yeah, Felix is in English. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah. Amadoka came out in German in three yeah. volumes. Yeah. 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 And in English? Yeah. yeah. So, okay. so, so we have Yuri Andrukovich with at least four translations, I think, uh, and yes. then the daughter with a couple more. Right? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. And I think they're very different from each other. Yes. Yeah. I think she's <laughs> 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 Okay, well, uh, these are my questions. So, uh, you know, I have written a lot more, but but I would like to open up the floor. And so please uh, give another chance to ask Mr. Afienka, uh, whatever questions come to mind. Yes, sir. Um, what happens when the translation goes back to Russian from the Ukrainian? The, the show. Чи будуть вас перекладати на російську? Я напевно знаю, що ні, тому що я дозволений. He, he probably will not be translated into Russian because he's not going to be, he's not going to agree to be translated into Russian. He doesn't want to be translated into Russian. Чому? Я не хочу бути учасником перекладного процесу навіть посередковим. He doesn't want to be a part of the Russian literary process any longer. 
even in the indirect way. I mean, that, that is fascinating because uh, you know, he was reviewed. Um, uh, and let me just say for those who are not aware and not familiar with this, but um, he was actually published in the most liberal um, publications, uh, journals in Russia. Znamia, for example, was one where I read many of his uh, stories and uh, parts of his novels that were published there. And so it's not that you know he was close to any Russian nationalist uh, publication or anything like that. And still, right? So it's the, the, the level of um, abandonment is a lot more profound than just political views. So can, can one say that? Is that, is that fair to say? Ваше покидание російського це так як ну я не знаю це прокласти. Ви просто подбули ще того цього. Ви відкинули це від себе. Чи фундаментально фундаментально звиклися? Це дуже важкий процес і пов'язаний він не з імпульсивним боком. It's a very difficult, very difficult process for them. It's not an impulsive decision, but it's an intellectual development. So it has a conscience. And part of it, uh, part of his decision has to do with conscience. Справа в тому, що коли росіяни в 14 році анексували частину українських територій, вони це робили під гаслом захисту усіх повномовного населення. When the Russians annexed parts of Ukraine territory in 2014, they were doing that under the um, uh, slogans of uh, we are protecting and safeguarding Russian speaking people. Таким чином вони зробили мене причиною війни. Мене усіх повномовного and they therefore they made me a Russian speaking Ukrainian the reason for the war. Mm -hmm. They made he as a Russian speaking Ukrainian became the reason for the war because they annexed it, they annexed Eastern Ukraine to protect him. The pretext. Yeah, the, the pretext, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. No, it's a this was a very difficult situation for him personally, but he had to make a decision because the situation was directed at him personally. In 2014, he knew no Ukrainian. He couldn't even speak to a saleswoman in a supermarket in Ukraine. So at 45, he decided um, um, that he was going to learn Ukrainian to such a level that he could write in it. And he thought that his plan was to, uh, to write in two languages. He would write one novel in Russian, one novel in Ukrainian. He didn't want to abandon or throw away the Russian language because it was the language with, that his mother spoke to him. But after the invasion um, on February 24th of this year, he decided that he would work only in Ukrainian. It's not an easy decision, and it's still a painful decision. But he's gone and passed the point of return. I wanted to ask a question similar to what you had asked about, namely, what if a Russian publisher approaches Serafiyenka and says, we would like to have Money Green, um, uh, Songs of Love and Death, uh, in Russian? And if I understand correctly, you would not give permission. Is that correct? If the Russian government comes to us and says, "We want to give you the money to the Russian government," we don't give permission. No, this is a violent attack. Russia can't. After Ukraine wins the war, no. 
can I ask a question? Of course. Uh, I want to I want to find out what will be the fate of his Russian literary output. Will these things be translated into Ukrainian? Will they be part of something that is no longer a part of his life? I mean, what is the what is the fate of these works? Я не знаю, я ці права, ці права маю на ці книжки, і оскільки я, я приклад, значить, в цій книгі довгі часи, котра перекладена, котра була з першою інтересом російською, то може, може, принаймні, буде перекладений роман Демон Декарти, який є насправді першою книгою цієї трилогії. Це трилогія Демон Декарта довгі часи і моделі. Там про місто Зен. So um, he has the rights to all of his works, and he hasn't yet made a, a complete decision. One of the books that we have here, The Length of Days, has been translated in, into Ukrainian. And um, uh, the, the demon of Descartes uh, and The Length of Days and the Green were thought of as a trilogy. So uh, there may be some translations ahead. Чи ви би хотіли перекладати? Щоб щоб ці речі були в українській мові? I want the the he feel that his Russian literary output should be translated into Ukrainian. Я думаю, що це було дуже добре. He thinks that that would be great. А бо я завжди писав на українському матеріалі. Yeah, even though he wrote, I guess in this in this regard is a bit like Rohan because even though he wrote in Russian, he the, the things that he dealt with in Ukrainian. Right? Then, uh, if I may ask one more question, then I'll, I'll turn again. Uh, you also write poetry, both poetry um, uh, that was published in Russian, and, and you were quite um, uh, productive in this in this genre. Will you return to poetry? Have you already made your return to poetry in Ukrainian, or because poetry is even more personal and intimate than prose? <laughs> Чи ви будете писати більше інтенсивно, бо поезія вона більш інтимна навіть ніж проза? Так, так, я знаю, я думаю, про це і я писати російською не можу вірші, а у певного левела ще не набуло на мій українською мовою. То я маю надію, що може за кілька років я зроблю невеличку державність. He can no longer write poetry in Russian, but he doesn't feel his command, uh, his level of Ukrainian is good enough for poetry yet. But he's working at it and he thinks that he'll get there soon. Very interesting. All right, so now there were several hands up. So please, uh, who wants to? Yes, sir. Roman Kalich, I come from Koya University, Lviv. Uh, could you talk more about your life before 2014, about your identity, about more about your literature and identity. Did you feel part of Russian cultural space? What your connection with Ukraine? Have you, did you feel comfortable with being Russian speaking Ukrainian? Could you be more specific you about know, just to get a better picture? Did you speak Russian or did you speak Ukrainian? Did you speak Ukrainian? Did you speak Russian or did you speak so uh, uh, Volimir's response is that he's uh, not sure that he's taught he was part of the Russian language uh, world because he was living in Ukraine. And his first the first language that he heard were you could was Ukrainian because his grandmother used to read him Ukrainian fairy tales when he was a child. No, the Russian language Ukraine is not Russian. The Russian language, um, the Russian speakers um, of, of Ukraine are not Russian society. This is not a Russian world. We have Ukrainian speakers, Ukrainian speakers, Romans, Romans live a lot of them. Mm. So um, there, where Volodya lived in uh, in the next, 
there were many Roma gypsies who lived around that area and they were Ukrainian. Uh, he wants to say that a nation is a personal choice, and he has made that choice. But the, the reason why he made this choice does not lie only in the events that we're seeing so uh, the, the the primary reason is that he remembered ukrainian from his childhood he read books in ukrainian in the library and he was part of the ukrainian world so this is the Ukrainian um, cultural and mythological context that he doesn't really know how to how to express. But for example, Ukrainians have Christmas carols, Russians don't. Yes. So their family celebrations, the holidays were multilingual. They sang songs in four languages, in Ukrainian and Russian, in German and Yiddish. The language situation was complicated. But the cultural situation was very deeply based in all things Ukrainian. No, you said the Mushcho, Mista, which I know the promissory of Skilki, the Drogo, the Drogo, the Drogo, the Seven Spirit, the Seven of Silver, and Scotty, the Bully, Russian Commodity, and the Sellish Shed of Polo. The cities, Ukrainian cities, which were rebuilt after World War II through collective efforts of people from all over the Soviet Union were then by definition Russian speaking, but everything outside the city was Ukrainian speaking, all the villages and small towns. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, family members who would come from the from the village to visit them would speak this this patois called Suzhi, which is a mixture of Ukrainian and like Spanish, a mixture of Ukrainian and um, a very, very powerful element of, um, of this journey of Volodymyr is his um, family memory, the, the memories of the Volodymyr, the famine of uh, repressions of people being shot, that played a role. My grand, his grandmothers knew exactly who created the genocidal family in Ukraine. Чи ви відчували утиски? Моє питання, коли чи ви як російськомовні відчували утиски? Так, в тому той проблема, коли ж. He was was in the weather. He felt that he was um, uh, discriminated. Discriminated yes. against the Russian people. Так, в тому той проблема полягала. Причина, чому я так завзято почав вивчати мову, що я 45 років жив, і мені жодного слова Богом ніхто не сказав. That's, that was the reason why he started learning Ukrainian, because for 45 years he spoke Russian and nobody ever discriminated моєї батьківщини. He didn't need to be protected from his own country. Мені потрібно було показати всім, що для українця, навіть російськомовного, українська мова не проблема. Yeah, he wanted to show that even for a Russian-speaking Ukrainian, the Ukrainian language is not a problem for Jew. Thank, thank you very much for inviting me to live here. It's really fascinating what you're telling. And my name is Alexander Kutik. I'm here at IR as also a fellow. Because what, what, what Volodymyr is telling just for the audience is basically we see it in the sociological polls where over years, there was a separation between language 
and national identity. Your language does not define national identity in Ukraine, and that's a, that's an amazing example. And uh, I also uh, want. Они могут сказать, что они могут сказать, у вас просто прекрасный приклад того, что мы можем, как социологи, не знаем, что за останние 25 років, что национальная наша, наша национальная идентичность, она не вызначается. Это очень хороший приклад. Я тоже хотел сказать, что я выросла в ЖНВ, как русскоязычный person. Of course, I learned the uh, Ukrainian in uh, school. Uh, in fact, I learned, I studied in a Russian speaking school where my school was one of the best in the Olympiads in Ukrainian language. <laughs> so I, I, I just say that there was of course no discrimination. Моє питання до вас, як до митця, особливо в літературі. Зараз в Україні відбуваються дискусії, що нам робити з російськомовними письменниками, які вже не мають змоги вчити мову, бо вони померли дуже давно. Я маю, наприклад, дискусію на коло Болгакова, його цей спадок український, російськомовний. Хтось каже, що треба це взагалі забути, не знати, трати музеї. Інші кажуть, так це ж наша складна, наша історія. Який ваш погляд на ці дискусії, як ми це? So my question, I will just say my question in Ukraine, we currently have a lot of discussions about the Russian-speaking writers and the cultural heritage of Ukraine, which is historical. So these people like Volgakov, they have no opportunity now to switch to Ukraine. So there and some say we should uh, abandon their studying and museums. Others say this is our heritage. We, if we are a multinational country, we should accept it. So I my question to Volodymyr as a as an artist himself, like what how do you look at this uh, discussion? <laughs> Котра дійсна, від котра ще залежить спілкування в цьому приводі. Мені здається, це в першу чергу емоції і намовність. Інша справа полягає в тому, що занадто багато пам'ятників російського культури на країні. The other problem is that there are too many uh, statues and monuments to Russian culture throughout Ukraine. We understand why this was done. It was an imperial drive to uh, remind people and give people Every on every step of their daily life, examples of Russian culture, of Russian imperial culture, and and that has to be dealt with. Тим більше після Бучі, після Ізюма, після того, що російська культура приїхала на танках. Particularly after all of these atrocities that we've seen in places like Bucha and Ізюм, when Russian culture came into Ukraine in tanks. Ні, знаєте, з Бужуням довелося майже місяць пожити в окупації, ніж Буч і Бородяк. Володимир і Олеся lived under Russian occupation for a month in Буча. Ви знаєте, вже на другому тижні окупації я своїми руками всі ці музеї сам. After the second week of occupation under the Russians, he would have dismantled all of those museums on his own, with his own brain. І я розумію, що це нас веде травми. Що потрібно якось цим працювати інакше, ніж це цивілізовано. He understands that that sexual reaction is a result of trauma, and in reality, we have to behave in a much more civilized manner. І це повинна бути державна, навіть державної політики, внутрішні прийняті певні рішення, і я сподіваюся, що колись вони будуть прийняті. It's a it's this should be an issue of state policy where the government decides. How to do this in a civilized manner? Але в кожному випадку я думаю, що навіть якщо закриють музей Богакова чи інші якісь музеї, 
пов'язані з російською культурою. Зараз, коли точиться війна, я, я пробачу цим людям, які це роблять, тому що це все одно обґрунтована емоційна ситуація. Хай потім прийдуть наші діти і скажуть, ні, ні, щось вони значить, занадто багато боролися, значить, давайте повернемо. Хай діти скажуть. If a museum, uh, if Bukhakov museum or some other museum to a Russian uh, cultural figure is closed, Vladimir can understand why it's closed and he will understand why it has been closed. And he's not going to have a problem with it. If our children, the next generation, wants to create a new set of museums, they can do that. They feel the need for it in some way, shape, or form. Мені потрібна, здається, що абсолютно потрібна санація української культури, санація української культури, на тому що санація від залишків цих імперських. Як сказати, що мать я англійською? Хто знає? Клензінг. Клензінг. Володимир Філдс, що українська культура, українська спеціальність має бути клензінг від російської інфлюенції. Санітайз. I wanted to uh, ask you uh, what influence did on uh, you and, and generally in Ukraine uh, uh, have uh, authors and poets and, and cultural leaders that actually left Ukraine and continued their work in the diaspora, like Ulas Samchuk, uh, Bahriani, and, and others? Uh, did they have, do you feel like they had an influence on the current um, uh, development of literature in Ukraine and to what degree? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 Діаспорі, який вплив мали ці люди і їхня праця на українську літературу сьогодні? Тут школу знають і пам'ятають, і велику шану постійно вдають всім спеціалістам української літератури, тому Гарвардський український інститут, як потужну інституцію, яка зберігає нашу пам'ять. Котра дуже багато працює в цьому, і е, про цак, здається, да, це професор, це від Бафріцак, я побачаюсь. Е, ну, це ж абсолютно геніальна героїчна постійна. They have been influential, people know about them, and uh, the create uh, the New York School of Writers, uh, novelists and uh, and poets are quite well known to Ukrainian. Uh, Ukrainians and Ukrainian literary figures. And um, the fact that the Ukrainian diaspora, Ukrainian writers and intellectuals created uh, the Ukrainian Research Institute in Harvard is, is considered a great accomplishment. And Pritzak is, is very respected for that. І знають і читають, це частина нашого українського культурного контексту, з неї ми себе і не мислимо, і не будемо. Є ще нові вибори українських діаспорів, Василь Махнов, який знаходиться в Нью-Йорк. Насправді, якщо ті, хто є в Вашингтоні, то буде великий справа з цим новим книгом, який був транслювано в англійській, в Дюпонт Спейсі, на тиждень, на тиждень. Yeah, at Dupont Underground. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm with Plum and Press, so okay, great. Um, yeah. We're, we're yeah. going to be hosting. Uh, and uh, and Oksana Lutsetina, who is um, also a very talented writer, she's from Budvorod, um, and she teaches in a university in Texas. I forget which one. <laughs> І в Нью-Йорку ми спілкувалися, а так ми спілкувалися і в Кембриджі, і в Бостоні, і в Кевені, в тому числі з українськими студентами. Я відчуваю цю абсолютно неймовірну її. 
Uh, William is roughly one third into his tour. He's spoken at um, at Yale, uh, several appearances in New York, Atlanta, and one of the things that he has felt very profoundly is a unity. He's spoken to Ukrainian students, new Ukrainian emigrants, and he feels a great sense of togetherness. Yeah, there was a very moment when we lived in the Ukrainian community. He was very touched um, um, when he and Olesev, who now uh, speak only Ukrainian amongst themselves, were at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and uh, they were looking at the Impressionist collection there and discussing it amongst themselves in Ukrainian, and people walked up to them and thanked them for speaking Ukrainian. Uh, well, his next stop is going to be um, Cleveland and Chicago, and so he doesn't know what that community is like, but every place that he's been, he feels that, that these Ukrainian communities in Ukraine, it's one body, it's a united um, Um, the conversations that he's heard here from Ukrainians who are very deeply involved in helping the Ukrainian armed forces, sending humanitarian and medical aid to Ukraine. It's it's very um, it's very impressive, and it's the same kind of work that volunteers are doing in Ukraine. This speculation is that it's completely different. In which area, in which community, American, in which area, it's like this, 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 Um, uh, someone said this during one of one of his um, one of his meetings that Ukrainians, even though they live in America or in other countries, they still care about Ukraine. They still worry and work for Ukraine. Russians don't. Once they leave Russia, they don't care about Russia. Yes. So I was wondering if, if he had has colleagues in Russia, writers, I mean, and and has he had any contact with them since the invasion of February? <laughs> so he has uh, contacts with people through social media. Uh, he never had uh, very close friends um, that were Russian, but there were acquaintances, acquaintances and colleagues. And, um, he mentioned one particular woman who had, uh, who was a Russian woman, who had um, high positions in a couple of Russian language publications, who has now also made the move to speak only Ukrainian, switch to Ukrainian. No, as just for you, just for you, see his watch new movement, who's it? Um, a certain a certain segment of his Facebook friends um, are no longer Facebook friends. They, I have a question about something you wrote in 2016. It was a book review um, uh, that came out in the journal Kreshetik. 
and it was on a book um, by Michael Goldschwartz, which was called Never Say That This Is Going To Be Your Last Path. Which was the title was taken from the song of Jewish partisans from 19. He's been well, quite prolific, but it's very remarkable. I found it remarkable because um, it actually, of course, it comes from a terribly tragic time in which uh, human life was worth hardly anything, and um, and the uh, the plot of that of one of those stories is that. Um, a young pianist is uh, on the river Lubyanka mm -hmm. and is uh, tortured to death uh, by her uh, by her captors. So by, by uh, I mean, that's a very story or pianistry. And her soul moves into the piano that and has been shot? taken away from her apartment. And that that piano goes to the daughter of one of her tormentors, of one of the speakers. And and now this daughter. Uh, who lives in the secret service community suddenly uh, you know shows a a talent for music and for playing and so on and so on. And I found why I was thinking why would why did you choose to actually review that that book? And I thought there's a kind of a metaphysical sense of optimism in it that maybe you share. Can one say that? <laughs> Well, you know, basically, I wanted to ask: Is he optimistic in general in his approach to life uh, and 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 to the world and to Ukraine in particular? To be optimistic, I have that impression. I'm not, I'm not sure. Sometimes there's not enough strength to be happy. Yeah, so you calm down and open up a good bottle of water. <laughs> so this was my timid attempt to end on optimistic no, okay. <laughs> A better way of doing it. So please, there's still time for a question, sir. I have one question and one clarification. Question is, understand how you feel about the Russian language, Russian, you know, statue, Ukraine, and Facebook, you know, friends in Facebook. My question is, since when you feel that like, better? Um, since February this year or before, if this before, since when? How far before? <laughs> His distancing from the Russian language and, and Russian stuff began in 2014 when the Russians first invaded. Because this is when he realized that language was being used as a weapon. And this Russian language is a danger not only to himself personally, but to his people and his nation and his country. He wants to be very, very clear about this. 
he is convinced that there are no bad languages. Who are the Kohanists? There are bad names. Um, the clarification I want to make is that if I understood correctly, I think you mentioned at home there are four languages Russian, Ukraine, German. They sang songs in those four languages. Okay, I, uh, my question is. Now I'm trying to get a connection why German and German. Uh, 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 the, city, the city of Donetsk grew around uh, Jewish settlements on both sides of the Kanyas River. So there was a Jewish community there as the city grew. Volodymyr's grandfather was Belarusian. Uh, he had a friend who spoke um, and sang uh, in German very well. Uh, Mm -hmm. um, they just sang in different languages. They took pleasure in singing in different languages. And they sang a lot of Ukrainian songs, um, Ukrainian folk songs, but they never sang Russian folk songs because they simply didn't understand them. Because they're, they're quite horrible. Bereza is a birch. So I'm not sure. You understand? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, Henry, please. Yeah, um, Ukrainian political scientist uh, Vladimir Kulik has described a process of uh, the shedding of Russianness uh, taking place in Ukraine in at least the last decade or so, and so. Kind of, a, I'm curious about your um, own journey, how it was received among your acquaintances, friends, family, those around you. Um, did you find a lot of people making similar transitions um, as early as 2014, maybe later? And do you think now maybe more are um, taking such a step or path? Yeah. Володимир he was fortunate enough to end up in the Ukrainian community in uh, in Kiev when he had to flee the net. And um, he and uh, his wife befriended Sofia Andukovic and her husband. They rented their house, um, their apartment uh, in, in Kiev. So he was in a very Ukrainian cultural uh, And people were very kind to him. When he was trying to speak Ukrainian, they would say, relax. We see that it's very, very difficult for you. You can speak Russian. And he said, and his, um, he was determined because he had decided that he was going to speak Ukrainian and learn Ukrainian, and he was sitting. 
And because he took this decision and he acted in this way, that's why we have on the green today. Але звичайно, що були люди, котрі російськомовна, скажімо, певна певна шара. There were there were circles, there were people who um perceived Bolivian's choice in a very negative way. А чому? Why? Why? Тому що їм здавалося. He thinks it's good that they can see that it's a negative thing. Їм здавалося, що я, котрий отримав міжнародні літературні премії в Москві, я повинен був би залишатися саме російським автором в Києві, це підтримувало загалом. Uh, so the, the Russian language circles felt that he, having received awards, um, uh, Russian awards for writing in Russian, should stay true to this calling, to this situation, as, as if he owed them uh, something for those awards. No, I was He's an introvert, and it's not all that important to know what other people think. What's important to him is that his conscience be clear. That's an optimistic ending. <laughs> <laughs> How do you imagine the Ukrainian culture in the future after the victory? Uh, is it more like to be a monolithic Ukrainian national culture or multicultural, multilingual, multi-ethnic culture? Не знаю, не знаю в майбутньому, але мені здається, що ті процеси, що йдуть, однозначно вказують на мономовність. І українською і пишуть все більше і більше розмовляють на вулицях. Я чув, як люди відчутно до війни цієї останні, це початку вони розмовляли російською, вони розмовляють не вік, але вони намагаються, всі намагаються, і це загальний тренд. Путін і Росія знищили російську культуру, російську культуру, і це немає повернення. Він не може бачити майбутнє, але він думає, що це буде monolinguistic future in the sense that Ukrainian will continue to make inroads Ukrainian as a language, as a um, engine of culture will continue growing. He sees and hears people in the streets of Ukraine speaking Ukrainian. Um, Russia and Putin um, have destroyed anything Russian for Ukrainian. And so um, he thinks that the language will just continue growing and, um, and being stronger. I don't know if you, um, Well, the Ukrainians here in this, uh, sorry, I'm not living. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, uh, um, the Ukrainians in this audience will know, but part of Russian um, legacy, whether it's imperial or Russian Soviet, was to reduce the Ukrainian language to the smallest possible space. Generations of people grew up believing that Ukrainian was a village language, a primitive language. It wasn't even a language. It was something that people should be ashamed of. People were encouraged to not speak it. People from the village came speaking absolutely beautiful, melodious Ukrainian, started speaking this crappy hybrid of Ukrainian and Russian, simply because um, everything in Ukraine, everything that was Ukrainian was considered substandard. Everything that wasn't lofty Russian, was considered to be second class. And so you, the Ukrainian language has been subjected to that kind of persecution, not just for 70 years under the Soviet uh, rule, but for 350 years. And, um, and I, for example, as somebody who loves the Ukrainian language, I'm very happy 
the language is coming back by you. Ну так, я хочу додати от до того, що ви зараз сказали, що це ж була це політика не тільки внутрішня радянська, це була політика спрямована на університети, скажімо, Америки і Європи, таким чином позиціонувати російську мову і культуру, що відносно до неї всі поруч, що знаходиться, і українська, це публічні, це говорять. Russia, Soviet Russian policy to position Ukraine uh, um, aimed at the Western intellectual world, at universities, to sort of ex, uh, extol the Russian culture and Russian history and uh, make sure that it was thought of as the highest possible thing. And everything that was Ukrainian was secondary. It was important to have Russian uh, chairs, Russian departments, and Ukraine was simply an active for the best. And it's very much still to start a war, but no, we crash. We have to know the situation. Yeah, and uh, you know better than than he what the situation is with Ukrainian studies in American universities. It's a huge deal, or if you say that, that when he was in Kiev, he was in Kiev. And it's a it's a strange uh, situation when you consider the fact that when Kiev existed. Moscow wasn't even an idea. So in Kiev, it was just a heart, a very cultural, international culture. Kiev at that time um, was a center of um, international culture. Do you remember the first famous letter in Kiev? It's a European letter. It's another thing. You know, in Kiev. So the, the, one of the first. Um, uh, literary um, sort of um, historic documents is a letter written in Hebrew by a merchant, by a Jewish merchant. Eighth or ninth century. So five, five, Russia will, Moscow will not exist for another five, six hundred years, but you already have this multicultural um, society and, and world in Kiev. Um, when writing in Ukrainian or Russian verses, uh, do you find the expressions you put out is a challenge or are they the same? In other words, and are there more words you can use in Ukrainian than you can in Russian? Or can you express more in one language than the other? Ви не пишете українською через російську. Тобто питання полягає в тому, в якій мові більше слів, чи більше понять, чи більше емоцій. Як ви це відрізняєте? Мови дуже різні, звичайно. Але вони мають одне гостріше. Each language has its own face. В цьому сенсі. Російська більш структурована і, я би сказав, комедійна. Russia is much more structured and rigid. He feels that it isn't growing, it isn't developing. Вона як дуже потужний, дуже прекрасний кристал, але в ньому немає вже життя. He's comparing the Russian language to a strong and beautiful crystal, but that it, the, but one that doesn't have any life left, it's devoid of life. Все дуже потужні інструменти мислення, писання, але але він ну і тому приклади, ну мені здається, станції російської літератури. The language is excuse me. The language is a great intellectual and uh, uh, a great intellectual tool, but it's also in a state of stagnation and um, a tool that is, is basically a third of great modern Russian literature. No, to me, the Ukrainian language, it grows, and it's a very unimaginable feeling to work in the field of culture and language, which is not only for yourself, but also for others. It's a very young age. So, uh, and the Ukrainian is developing, and it's growing, and it's very exciting to be part of that um, that current. Of, uh, of possibility. Uh, 
Дуже, дуже велике поле словотворчості, нових зв'язків між дослідчими словами. Word creation. Uh, Розвивається синтаксис дуже потужно. The syntax of the language is developing. Uh, uh, Моє відчуття, ну, оскільки я все ж таки філолог трішечки, значить, що і парадігма, і синтагма, значить, з тієї мови, Офіціальність, який всякісний скачок потім найближчий ціль. Uh, Volodymyr's um, education is that of a linguist, he's a linguist, and he, uh, he feels that Ukraine will take a, a, as a, as a language that is developing and growing and expanding, will take a great leap forward very quickly. Okay. Well then, um, please join me in thanking Volodymyr Thank you. 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 Thank you.